The pastors of America have metamorphosed into a company of shopkeepers. And the shops they keep are churches. They are preoccupied with shopkeepers' concerns, how to keep the customers happy, how to lure customers away from competitors down the street, how to package the goods so that customers will lay out more money. Some of them are very good shopkeepers. They attract a lot of customers, pull in great sums of money, develop splendid reputations. Yet it is still shopkeeping. Religious shopkeeping to be sure, but shopkeeping all the same. The marketing strategies of the fast food franchise occupy the waking minds of these entrepreneurs. While asleep, they dream of the kind of success that will get the attention of journalists. A walloping great congregation is fine and fun, says Martin Thornton. But what most communities really need is a couple of saints. The tragedy is that they may well be there in embryo, waiting to be discovered, waiting for sound training, waiting to be emancipated from the cult of the mediocre. The biblical fact is that there are no successful churches. There are instead communities of sinners gathered before God week after week in towns and villages all over the world. The Holy Spirit gathers them and does His work in them. I don't want to be a shopkeeper. Amen. <laughs> and you don't want to be at a shop, right? But it is so easy to do. And so this week we're gathered on Palm Sunday, a religious holiday. And we're gathered not as a successful church, but rather as a group of sinners. Seeking and sharing in a holy and loving God. As he does his work in each one of us. Take a look around right now. I want to invite you. There's a lot of faces that you might not know. Take a look around. This isn't about worldly measures of success. These, we, are the people that the Spirit of God has gathered. Let's love each other and honor God in each other. So we've been in this series on the kingdom of God. We've been exploring what it means and what it looks like to be in this kingdom under this rule and reign of this king. You know, a couple weeks ago, I talked about how the kingdom of God was a kingdom of peace. And specifically, we looked at Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, sometimes referred to as the six antitheses, where he takes the law of Moses, he takes the old covenant of the Jews, and he says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. Many scholars don't like the term the six antitheses because Jesus wasn't countering the old covenant, but rather fulfilling it, rather expounding it, rather increasing it. Jesus talked about the fact that God and his kingdom is this loving God who gives rain and sunshine both to the wicked and the righteous equally. Jesus said that we should be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect. And in this same way that we would love even our enemies and pray for those who hurt us. We talked about how Jesus took the law of Moses, fulfills it, and takes it to this unprecedented place, a place where no person could ever possibly fulfill it. But Jesus does. And he sets this example of what it looks like to live and love in this kingdom of his father. You know, these are difficult teachings of Jesus. How many of you guys have ever read a teaching of Jesus and thought, that's really hard. Okay, if your hand didn't raise, I'm assuming you haven't read any teachings of Jesus. And don't worry, there's still time. Why? Because Jesus strikes at the very heart of what it means to be human. He strikes at the very heart of what it looks like to be this broken vessel with great intentions unable to fulfill them. Have you ever experienced that in your life? You aspire for good but you fall short. And Jesus calls us towards this life that is counter to everything that we've ever known, 
toward a life where not only do we not commit murder, but we don't even harbor anger in our hearts toward other people. A life where not only do we not commit adultery, but we don't even look lustfully at others. A life where we don't get divorced easily, where we say what we mean and we mean what we say, and we live with integrity and honesty before others because we're conscious of God. Jesus calls us into this life where we don't take revenge, but rather we love other people, even our enemies and those that mistreat us. This is a life he calls us into that we look at and go, who is up for such a task? But Jesus says, follow me. He has paved a way. He has showed us a life that we could not live on our own. But through his power, we can follow him and live this life in this kingdom. Today, I want to talk about another aspect of the kingdom of God. And on Palm Sunday, I want to recognize Jesus as an unexpected king. Look over in Matthew chapter 22. I'm sorry, 21. The kingdom of God has a very unexpected king. In verse 1 of Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her by her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The scene here, if you're unfamiliar, Jesus has been in his public ministry for a few years. He's called people to follow him. He's amassed crowds. He's taught out, outrageous, audacious things. And then he says it's time to go to Jerusalem, the city where God lives, where God's presence intersects with earth and our reality. He says it's time for me to go there. Do you remember what Peter told him? No, 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 no. You can't go there. Jesus had made quite an impression upon the religious leaders who oversaw the temple worship in Jerusalem. Peter knew that if Jesus went back to Jerusalem, they were going to be in trouble. Their lives were going to be at risk. Peter's like, no, 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 no. I wonder if he was really concerned for his friend or just his own skin. Jesus says, what does he say to Peter when Peter tries to stop him from going back to Jerusalem? What does he say? Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the things of God in mind. It says that Jesus set his face like flint to go back to Jerusalem. This is known as the Passion Week. Mel Gibson made this famous and popularized in our culture. This is the last week of Jesus' life. And he says, I'm going to accomplish this mission for which I came. And he sets his face to go into the hands of death. He knows he's going to die. No one else has really comprehended that, at least not fully, although Peter seems to have given maybe a little bit of thought to it because he's like, I don't want to go there. So here in this scene, he's preparing to come into the city of God. And Jesus is consciously making preparations to enter Jerusalem in the fashion of Zechariah 9.9. The prophet, Matthew here, references 
the prophet Zechariah. He references chapter 9, verse 9, where he says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So Jesus is specifically and purposefully fulfilling this prophecy. And we don't know if it was like Jesus' supernatural ability to know that the guy was going to give him the donkey or if he had some sort of prearranged thing with this guy. We, you know, we don't know about all that. But he just tells his disciples, go get this because this is what's happening. What Zechariah was talking about is happening right now. And it was not what people were expecting. Instead of riding into town, as a king would often ride into town back from battle, armed on a war horse, Jesus instead rides in on this meek and humble baby donkey. Donkeys are often referred to as beasts of burden. Why do you think they're called beasts of burden? Because they bear all of our burdens. A donkey is of no use to humans except for to drag stuff and carry stuff. Their lives are spent in toilsome service to humans. In contrast, however, horses have long since been seen as majestic animals of speed and power, strength, giving humans triumph in war and combat, providing friendship and companionship. Have you ever known a horse lover? Any horse lovers in the room? You ever heard of a donkey lover? It just doesn't have the same ring to it, you know what I'm saying? These people here are expecting for the Messiah to come, to save them. This is what Messiah means. It just means Savior. Here is a people who have been oppressed and enslaved for generations, for centuries. And all of these religious people, these prophets of old, said, God's going to rescue you one day through a Savior. And He's going to come to Jerusalem, and He's going to set you free. And they're expecting this Savior, this Messiah, to come in on a war stallion, armed with his brigade, to overthrow, at this time, the Romans. So everybody's shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna originally meant God save us. And yet here comes Jesus on this beast of burden. They're expecting a king to liberate them from the oppression of the Romans. They're expecting to have political freedom and social equality. They're expecting for their Messiah to save them from their oppressors. They are expecting war. Instead, they get a donkey. Instead, Jesus comes not in war and military might, but rather in humility, in gentleness, and in peace. Today is known as Palm Sunday in the liturgy in Christian history, which is referring to this scene in the Bible. This scene where people are laying down cloaks and palm branches. The Sunday before the Friday Passover, the Last Supper, as it's often referred to, on which Jesus is crucified has become to be known as Palm Sunday. The Sunday where palms were laid down for the king. It's what we're recognizing and remembering today on our calendars. But for Matthew, for this gospel writer, this whole scene is meant to convey celebration, honor, reminiscent of the victory parades where triumphant kings and generals in the Old Testament were welcomed. Like what's happening in 2 Kings chapter 9, in verse 13, when Jehu, the Israelite, is appointed king over Israel. It says, They quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. There was a long-standing tradition that when a king was appointed or a king was returning from battle victorious, people would lay cloaks and things under them so they didn't even have to touch the ground. Matthew's saying this is what's happening with Jesus. He's a king, but he's not coming like anyone was expecting. Sometimes you might see your Bible subtitled, The Triumphal Entry. Has anybody got that subtitled in their Bible, The Triumphal Entry? 
It's become out of vogue now. You're probably reading a little bit of an older English version. Most scholars don't refer to this as the triumphal entry because while Matthew is painting the picture that Jesus is coming triumphant, he doesn't triumph the way anyone is expecting. So the newer version that I have in front of me says Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. But this kind of triumphal entry that Matthew is trying to help his audience, his Jewish audience to connect with, they're showing the crowds shouting, Hosanna, laying down cloaks, palm branches, and these are a symbolic way for all of these people to recognize Jesus as king. He's coming to free us. In fact, the Bible says that the whole city was stirred in verse 10. I'm sorry, verse, uh, where am I at here? Yeah, verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Does anybody, anybody reading something that says something else other than stirred? What does yours say? This is one of our things where we like to have everybody lay their own eyes on the Bible for themselves. Don't take my word for it. I'm not a shopkeeper. What does your Bible say? Yeah. Thrown into an uproar. Anything else? Anything else? Have anybody else? Moved. What else? Anything else? Any other Bible versions out there? Thrown into an uproar again? Shaken. Yes. So this word here that many Bibles translate stirred is actually a word meant to render shaking. As in an earthquake. Like when Jesus dies and the temple curtain is torn in two and the ground shakes, it's that same word. The city is going bananas. The town is shaking. People are stirred. People are moved. It's quaking. This is not some small trite thing. This guy riding into town, everybody knows about it. And what do they think is happening? Their king is coming to give them their promised salvation, their promised freedom from the Romans. Matthew invokes this messianic prophecy here in Zechariah 9, 9, verse 5. Say to you, daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He's referencing this prophecy in the book of Zechariah. But yet, for the Jews, his audience, who would have been well acquainted with these passages, the very next verse says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah said that the Messiah that would come would not bring war, but rather peace. And yet, in the midst of all of this, the city is stirred and shaken. They're getting ready for war. But God's heart, God's plan to save his people, humanity, was always through a Messiah and Savior of peace, not of war. Everyone expected, even wanted, war and liberation. So they hail their coming king with triumphant palm branches and cloaks. Except there would be no victory party when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. He was king, but unlike anyone expected. This happens for us, right? Sometimes we shout, Hosanna, God save us. Sometimes we find ourselves in need and we're asking God to be triumphant. To free us from something, to save us from something, to act in some way. And it doesn't happen like we expect, does it? Jesus was king, but he was not the king people were expecting. God does not always show up to save us in the way we're expecting. You know, the year I moved to Asheville, I was dealing with chronic physical and mental health issues. So what I do... I'm a good religious man, trying not to be a shopkeeper. I prayed. 
What did I pray? God, save me. God, take this away. God, make me normal again. God, remove me from this situation. God, 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 God. For a year. It changed very little. God did not save me the way that I was expecting or the way that I was wanting. I wanted God to just remove the struggle, to remove the tiredness, the exhaustion, the fatigue, to remove the anxiety and worry, to remove the difficulty and pain. But you know what he did? He tried to teach me that he was enough. He tried to teach me that he was enough even in pain, even in tiredness, that I could be well in my soul, even though my body might not be well. He taught me that his grace was sufficient. It's not what I wanted. It was not the salvation that I expected. We cry out for God to save us all the time in many different ways. Think about your own life. You're probably crying out for something right now. But let's be honest. God does not always save us like we're expecting. That's what Matthew is getting at here. Matthew is saying, guys, we were waiting to be saved, but it didn't look like we thought it would look. It didn't happen the way we thought it would happen. We want salvation in this one way, but it comes in another. We want that promotion at work. We want peace in our home with our spouse. We want to be loved, to have a special someone in our life. We have all these desires, all these needs. We struggle with chronic illness. We have a sudden death of a loved one. We're struggling to have children, but we really want them. Throughout the human existence, we have all these desires, all these needs, and they're very real. And yet, they're not always fulfilled. God's salvation does not always come in the way that we want or the way that we're asking for, but it does come. And here, salvation comes. But many people don't see it. They don't even recognize it. Which brings us to, I believe, Matthew's point. Matthew is trying to get his audience to wrestle with this simple question. Who is this? Just who is this Savior? And how is this Messiah going to save us exactly? When Jesus arrives and enters Jerusalem in verse 10, the whole city is stirred and they start asking, who is this? Now certainly there would have been people in Jerusalem who may have never heard of Jesus, certainly have never seen Jesus, but many people at this point would have been acquainted with this prophet from Nazareth who for three years had been traveling around this area, gathering great masses of people, doing miracles. This wonder worker of God shows up and Matthew poses this question for his audience. Who is this? Who is this really? Matthew gives the answer of the crowds. He says, the crowds say what? He's a prophet from Nazareth. Is that true? Yes and no. They answer that Jesus is a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And for Matthew, this is important. He's writing to his largely Jewish audience who were very acquainted with the Old Testament, seeking, longing for this salvation and this Messiah where they could finally be freed from these godless Gentile Romans who have slaughtered them and oppressed them just like every other nation and people group at that time in history. But he's trying to underscore this point that Jesus is not just a prophet, but rather he is the Messiah. He is the king He's not just a prophet, he's the king. But he's not the king they were expecting. Matthew's noting that the crowd said that Jesus was from Nazareth, but earlier in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 2, he's quoting 
prophecy from Micah that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. So here in chapter 21, Matthew is noting that the crowds missed the connection. He says, God told us the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. By the time he arrives in Jerusalem, Matthew's like, who is this Jesus? They're like, a prophet from Nazareth. They didn't see him as the Messiah King. They saw him as a man of God, but not the Messiah. This is what Matthew's trying to highlight here. They simply thought, this is a guy from Nazareth. And then you read John's gospel and he talks about this guy, Nathaniel. What does Nathaniel say about people from Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Matthew is highlighting these people missed Jesus' kingship. They missed that he was the Savior. It can be the same for us, right? We can think many things about Jesus. Oh, he's a good moral teacher. He gives me a few more holidays in my work year. He's a prophet like Muhammad and others. We have a lot of ways to answer this question. Who is this? Matthew's trying to help us answer it correctly. The gospel writers over and over and over again are trying to reveal Jesus as King and Savior, as Messiah, as the God who can save us, Hosanna. But it doesn't look like we often expect And he doesn't save like we expect him to save. His salvation doesn't come strutting into town as a military force with formidable weapons and a noble mission to vanquish what we think is evil. Jesus doesn't ride into Jerusalem and start handing out weapons to all the Jews and tell them to defend and free themselves from their Roman occupiers and oppressors. That's not what happens. God's salvation didn't come that Palm Sunday in the form of political freedom, social equality, or even religious freedoms. It didn't come in the form of a humanistic military power as a power play designed to overcome this evil and wicked empire of Rome. Instead, God's salvation came in the form of a Savior riding a beast of burden. Instead, he rides in filled with love for his enemies. Not just love for his friends, love for his enemies, willing to die a torturous death on a cross rather than to fight back. God's salvation does not come like we expect. This is not the salvation that anyone was looking for or wanted. We want Bruce Willis' diehard salvation. We want brave heart salvation. We want fill in our modern epic narratives of good overcoming evil. You recognize we have a very consistent narrative of what that looks like, right? It does not look like this. It is militaristic. It is walking softly and having a big stick. It's usually trying to defend and to uphold justice and free oppressors. But what's the problem with that narrative? It assumes that one human or group of humans is righteous and the other is wicked. But what did Jesus tell us in Matthew 5? That we should be perfect like God. How? Because he sends sun and rain on the wicked and righteous alike. We should love everyone equally. And so salvation comes through this heavenly perfect father. Not through war. Not through might. But through death. Through self-sacrificing love. This king who rides into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday is the same king today that desires to ride into our life and our heart and our mind. He desires to ride triumphantly to show us a better way to live 
an upside-down, peace-filled, non-violent way to love, a way to be perfect, as His Heavenly Father is perfect. But true to form, He doesn't override us. He doesn't conquer us with His might and power, though He could. He appeals to us through His own sacrifice, which is what we just remembered in the Lord's Supper, that He invites us to His kingship. He does not lord it over us. So as we approach this Resurrection Sunday next week, what often is referred to as Easter, I think we've got to all wrestle with the same question. Who is this? This Jesus is... How do you answer that question? How you and I answer that question will determine all of the rest of the steps of our lives and beyond. Perhaps you're just now wrestling with this question for the first time, really considering, who is this Jesus? Because I know for me, the way that I used to answer this was how culture, family, media had answered it for me. Because I had never really wrestled with this question for myself. I just osmosis absorbed the answer that was given to me. And so I would look up at fine art paintings of this Caucasian, brown-haired, blue-eyed, flowing Jesus character with a little baby lamb in his arms. And I could just hear the bah in my imagination. I saw, again, always Caucasian, man sitting down at a table with little children with some scripture reference. Let them come to me. And I thought, oh, he likes kids. I hate kids. Oh, man, baby's kids. This is what I used to think. <laughs> then I had my own. And, of course, you know, they're awesome. <laughs> but some kids, you know, I mean, you know, let's be honest, you know, okay. And I thought, oh, wow, Jesus, he loves kids. He said, you know, who is this? He's Mr. Rogers on steroids. That's who it was. And he gives me a get out of hell free card for when I die. Which at one point in my life I thought was going to be any moment. Then I wrestled with this question for myself at one point. I started to learn what does this say about that question. And then I came to some real crossroads. You might be at those crossroads too. You might be wrestling for yourself. Or perhaps finding a different answer to this question than you've ever known before. This question is so relevant for us. T next Sunday will be the largest church attendance Sunday in our country, hands down. But how many people are wrestling with this question? Who is this? I want to encourage you, if you are wrestling with this question, maybe for the first time or maybe again, I want to encourage you to please talk to someone. Come talk with me. We would love to sit down and open up these sacred scriptures to see how did these people answer this question. That we can talk about this King, this Messiah Jesus, who is unexpected but most welcomed, a King of King and a Lord of Lords. Let's pray together.